Second Kings chapter two. If you're there, say amen. Do you have it? You have the passage. Now, Second Kings chapter two. It's going to give us a good idea of the call that God placed upon a young man named Elisha. This is going to be the very first day of his ministry alone. But it's going to start beside the teacher named Elijah. And so we'll start out in verse 1, and I want you to pay attention to the places he's going to visit right here because they will be important to his life and to what God is calling him to do. So I'm in 2 Kings chapter um, Second Kings chapter 2, 2 Kings chapter 2 and verse 1. And it came to pass when the Lord will take up Elijah into heaven by a whirlwind that Elijah went with Elijah, Elisha from Gilgal. So he started out in Gilgal. And Elijah said unto Elisha, tarry here, I pray thee, for the Lord has sent me to Bethel. And Elisha said unto him, as the Lord liveth and as thy soul liveth, I will not leave thee, so they went down from Bethel. So remember, he started out at Gilgal, then he went to Bethel, being led by the prophet. And this, listen to who came to talk to him. In verse 3, and the sons of the prophet that were at Bethel came forth to Elijah and said unto him, Knowest thou not? that the Lord will take away thy master from thy head today? And he said, yeah, I know. I know it. Hold ye your peace. And Elijah said unto him, Elisha, tarry here. I pray thee, for the Lord hath sent me to Jericho. So now he's going to a third place. He, he, he went to, um, he came out of Gilgal, went into um, Bethel. Now is heading to Jericho. And he said, ah, as the Lord liveth and as thy soul liveth, I will not leave thee. So they came to Jericho. And the sons of the prophet that were at Jericho came to Elijah and said unto him, Knowest thou um, that the Lord will take away thy master from thy head today? And he answered, Yeah, I know it. Hold ye your peace, your peace. And Elijah said unto him, Terry, I pray thee here. For the Lord has sent me to Jordan, and he said, As the Lord liveth, and as thy soul liveth, I will not leave thee. And they too went up, went on. So now he's heading to the Jordan. And you're going to find out how, uh, in verse 8, for, uh, they get to Jordan. Verse 8, And Elijah took his mantle and wrapped it together and smote the water, the waters, and they were divided hither and thither, so that they too went over dry ground. And it came to pass when they were going over that Elijah said unto Elijah, Ask what I shall do for thee before I be taken away from thee. And Elijah said, I pray thee, let a double portion of thy spirit be upon me. The, the young man was spiritually ambitious, spiritually ambitious. And he said, verse 10, that has asked a hard thing. Nevertheless, if thou see me with, when I am taken from thee, it shall be so unto thee. But if not, it shall not be so, <clears throat> now let's jump some more because uh, verse 13, verse 13. Now here I want you to pay attention because now we have Elijah being by himself, Elijah being by himself. Verse 13, he took up also the mantle of Elijah that fell from him and went back and stood by the bank of the Jordan. And he took the mantle of Elijah that fell from him and smote the waters and said, where is the Lord God of Elijah? And when he also had smitten the waters, they parted thither and thither and Elijah went over. And when the sons of the prophets, which were to view at Jericho, saw him, they said, The spirit of Elijah doth rest upon Elisha. And they came to meet him and bowed themselves to the ground before him. Verse 14. 
Verse 19, now he's in Jericho, by the way. He's in Jericho. That's what verse 18 tells us. Now we're in verse 19. And the men of the city said unto Elijah, Elijah, behold, I pray thee, the situation of this city is pleasing as my Lord seeth, but the water is not, and the ground is barren. And he said, bring me a new cruise and put salt therein, and they brought it to him. And he went forth into the spring of the waters and cast the salt in there and said, Thus saith the Lord, I have healed these waters. There shall not be from thence any more death or barren land. Verse 23, And he went up from thence unto Bethel, and as he was going up by the way, there came forth little children out of the city and mocked him and said unto him, Go up, bald head. Go up, bald head. And he turned back and looked on them and cursed them in the name of the Lord. And there came forth two she bears out of the wood and tore forty and two children off them. And he went from thence to Mount Carmel. I want you to remember that. Verse 25. He went from thence to Mount Carmel, and from thence he returned to Samaria. Let's pray. Pastor, could you pray for us? Amen. Now, that's the hard part. The easy part comes now. So I have me this mighty man of God in formation time. He is being thought how he's going to be the man that God has called him to be. Now, of course, I am going to mess up the video, but I'm going to come down here. I feel too far. Now, <clears throat> this is where we're at with this young man. He is trying to become the man that God has called him to be. He is the next prophet. He's going to lead the whole nation as the main prophet, the main preacher, the main leader in the word of God. This is the people of God. These are the people who are supposed to serve God with all their heart. The prophet's shoulders are going to carry the faith of a nation. Not only that, he has to step into the shoes of a big prophet who can bring fire from heaven. Following after that is not easy. And he's going to speak that day. He's going to receive what God wants from, from him. Now the very height of the call of Elijah, the one he, who taught him how to be a prophet, who polished him and his calling, had been at the top of his high calling at Mount Carmel. It was at Mount Carmel where he confronted the, the, the prophets of Baal and had brought fire from heaven in the presence of everyone in that place. God not only confirmed that that was his prophet, but also backed up every word that the prophet had said. And Elisha, as a young man, had either been there or very probably just heard about it. But everyone in Israel knew that was the place where this thing happened. Elijah is now going up to heaven. Elisha is left. And his whole life and ministry is to get up to that level. To get up back to Mount Carmel, to acquire the high calling of God in his life, to get to the place where he can be the maximum use in the presence of God. He has to go to Carmel. Same place where Elijah did that. And so now the old prophet is driving the young man and taking him into different places. He has come to Bethel, and then to Jericho, and then to Jordan, and all three places that were Bible colleges. And so young men will come up to the prophet and speak into his ear, and to the young men, 
because they saw him as a student also, as one of the ones who was being taught, and they would tell him prophetic things. You know that your master is being taken up. These were all young men who were serving God and who were preparing themselves for the ministry, and they were a little envious, if you would be human nature, to know that the thing that this young prophet had more than them was that they got to see the master, the teacher, every now and then. This young man lived with him. In fact, he is described later on as one who pulled water upon the hands of Elijah. It was the whole expression of being so close as a servant, listening to the word, seeing the miracles, the power of God upon that old prophet. He's gone to these three places, to Bethel and Jericho, to the Jordan, just finding different young men who are there. And though those places had their issues, this was not the time for him to deal with them. But now when the old prophet is gone and the mantle falls, now Elijah is in trouble. Because now the eyes are on him. Don't you like it when people have expectations that you cannot meet? I used to play basketball, and, and it was about 100 pounds ago, by the way. I used to play basketball, and the coach will see the game going in a certain direction. He will grab my shirt. You know, I guess they didn't teach them no, no manners back in that day, and grab me and put me right on his face and yell at me. I want my game back. What do you want me to do? Well, get in there. Give me back momentum. Be, give me back the time. Hit somebody if you have to. That's what he actually told me. Probably because I was really a little too aggressive. And he wanted me to disrupt whatever was happening in there. I had three different coaches, and all three different coaches used to send me in to do this. So I guess it was me. Expectations really high. Well, the young prophet now is standing there, and he is being expected to make these things happen. Fire from heaven. Yeah, that's about to happen. It will not rain for three years, said the old man. You, you want to walk into that? Face down a king that was wicked and look him in the eye. That was the steps he wanted, he had to walk into. The mantle falls, now he's got a big problem. Because coming from there to here, the Jordan was over, you know, flooded. And there was a lot of water on the way here. You know, the old prophet hit the water and we walked on dry ground. And now I'm on the other side and I need to get back over there. Where is the old prophet? He's gone. He's up in heaven having a blast. Laughing at the rest of us. <laughs> Let's see what this young man does. Okay. Did you know I dropped the, the mantle? Like, what am I going to do with this mantle? You know, <laughs> I mean... What is it? Like wave it, sell it for a little? What is it? You know what I'm going to do? No, I know what I'm going to do. He stands right in front of that water. He doesn't have a bridge to cross. He has to prove himself from the day that he started. From the moment that the mantle came to him, it was a test. You think it's an accident that God left him right in a place where he cannot walk back? Why didn't he leave it open while this whole thing happened so he can walk back? Why have you, have you figured out when they walked the, the, the Red Sea, when they were walking across the Red Sea, do you remember that the same God that opened it also closed it? And yes, he killed all the Egyptians, but he also closed it so that it will not go back. Because we have a tendency to do that. But in this case, the young men needed to go back into the promised land. So now he has to be tested. Where are you going, Elijah? I know where my destination is. I'm going to Mount Carmel. We read it. 
That's what he's heading. Why are you heading to Mount Carmel? Because that's the height of my calling. And it's going to be represented in, in the challenges that I'm going to face now. Coming this way, the old prophet did everything. And all I had was friendly faces of the other students telling me cute things about prophetic things I already knew. Now I'm on my lonesome self and the whole nation is looking at me to see what's going to happen. And I got me this old mantle. That's all the old men left for me. 50 of the students who are spoken into his ear are watching him, by the way. They are looking at him thinking, what is he going to do? They're on the other side waiting on him, okay, you know. The old prophet would have done it a long time ago. What are you doing, young man? The Bible says he grabbed the mantle. He looks at the water. He hits it, and he asks, where is the God of Elijah? And the whole place starts to shake, and the whole thing begins to open up at the word of one Men being observed by a bunch of other students. That's it. And what God is doing with him is sealing him and honoring him in public and saying, you're the next one and I'm going to stand with you, but you're going to have to face the challenges that it takes to have the mantle of God upon you. There will be nobody coming to your rescue this time. There will be no one that you can call or email or FaceTime to give you a little idea of what to do. There will be nobody to come and take over for you when you get tired and weary. It is upon you and you alone. And I am going to be with you, but you're going to have to stay really close to me. He walked on dry ground, and if I know anything about human nature, it wasn't the walk of the howdy men thinking I got it going on, but in the one thinking I don't know what I got myself into. As pastor, it must have been great when they told you you're going to be a pastor here. They should have told you you're going to spend 30 plus years pushing on 40, messing with the same people. We love you and we hate you all at the same time. If things go bad, it's him. And if they go good, it's not him. Well, how do I know that? Because it happens to me and whatever it is that I do. But it's okay. What I am telling you in all of the presence of you following in the steps, you're facing it down. And now the prophet is thinking, I'm walking on dry ground. <laughs> but this is not all about, this is just the very first step. I'm going up to Mount Carmel. I'm looking for the price for the high calling. I talked to you about this a couple of weeks back. The high calling is the expression of the very top that God wants you to reach in this earth before he takes you home. The apostle Paul spoke about it. The young prophet walks in there. All of a sudden, a spiritual authority is upon him. All the other young men who were whispering to him like he was ignorant, now they're all coming to him and said, whoa, the spirit of Elijah is upon him. The spiritual authority, brothers and sisters, they doesn't come because you have a title and they'll call you missionary. Huh? It doesn't come because somebody says you graduated from Bible college. That doesn't even matter. It comes with the manifestation of the power of God. It comes when God backs up the words that you give and backs up the spirit in which you move. It comes because the anointing of God is dripping off your relationship with him in such a way that people may hate everything you do, but they have to respect the authority of God. How do you know? Because people will confront you right and left. Because people will fight with you all the time. Because people will belittle you all the time. But at the time of the trouble and of the struggle, the phone will ring and will say, please help me. Because they know that the one who parsed the Jordan is with you. The boys are all like, wow, he's not our classmate anymore. He's the man now. <laughs> For the very first challenge when you are going up toward Mount Carmel the, to your high calling is that manifestation of God's seal upon you to say you are mine. Not just in private now. Right? And now it's in public. I will manifest myself in what you do. I will bless what you touch. I will anoint the words of your mouth. 
I will back up what you do. I will give you wisdom. He's walking up. He gets to Jericho, and right there at Jericho, same you know, place where all the young men had come over to talk to him. Now they, what they come is people with expectations. They come over and they said, we have a land that is barren. It doesn't produce anything, so we need you to heal it. Wait a minute. Why didn't you tell the old men when we came through the other day? Why are you telling me this now? He could have done this easily. No, it's because you're the man now. So let's see if you really are the man. Let's see if you have that kind of relationship with God. Heal the land. Whoa. So the young man is full of God, though. He says, bring me a new cruise and bring me, put, put, it, put salt on it. And the Bible says, can you imagine him throwing salt upon the waters and thinking, I wish Elijah was here because I'm about to make a fool of myself. These people are expecting me to, show, to heal the land. That's not just a little tiny miracle. He had a cough and now he's healed. They want you to find the cure of cancer. So he's like there. And he's like, why? Because I'm going to the price of the high calling. And the problem going to Carmel is then in the steps, every step is going to be a challenge. First, you were challenged by the impossible door that is closed. And now you're challenged because the challenge is even bigger. They want you to produce fruit where there, would be, where there had never been fruit before. In fact, there was a curse in that land that Joshua the prophet had brought long before this. Joshua, the leader. And now they're asking him to undo that. To face down, not only follow after the steps of Elijah, but to face down the curse that Joshua had brought there and bring fruit. And the Bible says that until today, the best fruit in that land came from that place. He had faced down the fruit challenge. What is the fruit challenge, brothers and sisters? The fruit challenge is... It is good to have a good walk and talk a good talk. But a tree is known by its fruit. I love it when people come over to me and give me a card. Prophet, apostle, so and so. Some have, sometimes they have more gifts than Christ himself. And they want me to be impressed. Boom. The prophet, apostle just shook my hand. I'm not going to watch it for a couple of weeks. Let me get a little bit of the sweat so that I can set it out. You think that's funny? You just see what people sell nowadays. A little water from the Jordan. You know, if you put it under the pillow of your beloved, he will love you more. Sometimes I think they got it out of some witchcraft book. Nothing that prayer cannot do, but we have these weird things now, you know. This happened to be in Africa. Some people wanted my, my stuff. They said, you know, I mean, that's, you know, it's anointing, bro. No, that's sweat. It's not anointing. Now, it is for some other people, and people like Paul and Peter had that happen to them, but I ain't Paul and Peter, and I can tell you that. They can tell you that. But in the essence of the pursuit of God, this was something that the apostles will speak in the future about the high calling. This man will have to face down fruit, the fruit challenge. What is your fruit? What is the fruit for a pastor? Well, the fruit of the Spirit, obviously. But as, we, as we're talking about, about fruits that are, that, that are there, it's souls. Souls, souls that come to the kingdom. It is the growth of people in a church. And I don't mean here just the physical growth. I mean the spiritual growth of the people. What is the fruit of a, of a man who drives a truck? The God will take hold of his job in such a way that he will be a witness to everybody who's around him just by being who he is. The people will be touched wherever he goes. That God will produce something right and good wherever he is. 
Some of you have the most difficult jobs. And even in that place, you are a witness and you, your tree is known by its fruit. You can tell everyone that you're a Christian. And sometimes I listen to that and I cringe. One of the worst people that I've ever met in anywhere I am claimed to be a pastor. I remember hearing him when he was boisterous and claiming and scratching and stalking to people and using foul language. And at the end, he looked toward me and he said, I am pastor so-and-so. And he was actually from the same group that I was with. And I was like, oh, God, let me hide out. I'm not with this guy. Because a tree is known by its fruit. And whatever he thinks he is, he is not. That's the fruit challenge. You can sing the beautiful songs and preach the wonderful sermons, but the fruit challenge will always get you. Because it is always clear who's who when you look at their fruits. What are their fruits in their family? Uh huh. What are their fruits in their life? You tell me I'm a student, Oscar. I'm like, whoo. You're the one who has the most challenges. Oh, I know how this works as you are a Christian in, 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 in those kind of environments. Oh, I have been through all of that, brothers and sisters. It gets really interesting when people are trying to make a mess of what it is that the word of God is in a place. And I remember standing in so many of those places having to step forward because God was challenging me to have the right fruit and do not deny my name in this place. The fruit challenge. So he's faced down the authority challenge. He's God with you. And now he's facing down the fruit challenge. Are there fruits in your life? He thinks he's done, by the way. He's produced fruit, too. And he's gone now. He runs into Bethel, which means the house of God. Now he's going to face the mockers. You see that? On the way in, he faced nothing but cute little Bible college students patting his back and saying, we got you, brother. I mean, we got your back. Now he's on his way up to Mount Carmel, and all he's facing is challenges. He has been challenged by a river that will not be opened lest God intervenes. He has been challenged by a place that produces no fruit where God has placed him. Now he's got a whole crowd of young men coming behind him and laughing and mocking, saying, go up, bald head, go up. You're going up to the house of God. What an interesting concept. All these Mocking spirits, laughing and, uh, and saying all kinds of things. And if you think that these are all just words of the Bible, listen to me. The nation right now has millions and millions and millions of people that think that they can mock God. That are laughing right now because they said we are going to boot him even worse than we have booted him before. We are not going to allow him in our schools. We're not going to allow him in our public places. He's not going to be in our parks. I'm not talking about a president, by the way. I'm talking about Christ himself. We're going to put people in charge that are God haters and Christ haters, anti-Christ spirits. We're going to do this and do that, and they run around thinking that they're in charge and that they can mock. They can look at the ones who are trying to worship, and they will find something to laugh about it. Look at the Christians who need, who are weak-minded, and they need a crutch to be able to, to live this life. You know, they need some kind of psychological help. Every knee shall bow, I will tell them in their face, and every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. It's going to happen right here, right now, or it's going to happen then, but it will happen. Of those who are in heaven, the angels, of those who are on earth, us, and those who are under the earth, even the demons will have to bow down to Christ. He's going to face hell itself with his laughing face. Let me tell you what the mockers do. The mockers found you, find your faults, not the physical ones that you don't care about. See, if you call to me and you tell me, go up, fat boy, go up. It ain't going to do anything to me. I'm sorry. 
It doesn't. <sighs> Maybe some of you guys are really rugged in crowd and you really worry about your hairline. Those of you who are young, just wait. It's going to come for you. <laughs> Those of you who spend all your money on anti-wrinkles. I hope you don't go the way of surgeries. I know some people who cannot even smile. Because they've had so many surgeries, their faces don't move. Somebody suggested to me, get some baby buttocks, Oscar, because you always look angry. Like, I'm just going to fix this right here, right? <laughs> that will be interesting. But it will find your weakness. You have weaknesses, by the way. You have them. So do I. <laughs> the devil will whisper in your ear, you failure. Why are you pretending like you're going up to the house of God when I know what you were doing just last night? And the Christian will wither under that stare. It was a high priest named Joshua in the book of Zechariah who's standing in the presence of God with filthy garments and Satan on his right side, the Bible says, cursing him and accusing him. And the Bible says Satan was right about accusing him because his garments were filthy. Go up, you slacker. Look at your Bible study in the last month. You barely have dusted off that book. Go up. You hypocrite. Go up, you prayerless person. You know that this thing about going up to the house of God is just a fake. He will find what it is that is destructive, that will eat your life inside the things that you care and rub them in your face. Go up, you angry man. Look at how fiery you got with your wife, with your husband. If you're a valley person, this one fits you because I don't know what it is about the valley. But anger is kind of like natural. I love it when I see waitresses and, or waiters from the valley dealing with customers from the valley. It's awesome. I just watch it. We're demanding that. This water is cold. Well, you told me to put ice in it. Well, you put too much ice in it. I, wouldn't, I will not work in Starbucks in this town. I can tell you that. Because we're picky. And then we have the waiters and waitresses that are from here that are going to answer the right way. You know, it's like, hey, you know, whatever. Let's, let's spit a little. There you go. Taste it. I try not to get into it with kitchen people because you don't know what they can do to your food. So I'm like, yeah, you know, I told you not to put that, but please. And when you have that outburst toward your child or your brother or your mother, and you know that you know you should or not, the Holy Spirit will whisper in one ear, but the mocker, Satan himself, will say, Look at you hypocrite. You're going to church. And you just got angry on the way to church. That ever happened to you? Don't say amen, but it has happened to me. I'm coming over here to preach and I'm angry on the way. <sighs> Somebody cut me off. Be blessed that I'm going to preach because I need to be calm right now. Go up. He will find you. He'll find the ugly part of you and he will remind you of it. He will send his minions if he doesn't do it himself. His minions will remind you of it. And the problem is most of the time is true. I need an amen right there somewhere. Not all the time. Sometimes he's just lying. But a lot of the times he's standing there beside Joshua and he says, I look at the proof. He's got filthy clothes in your presence. God, aren't you the one who strikes them dead? You chased me out of heaven because I did the same thing this guy is doing right here. But the father will say, sitting there, the problem is that I have me a Christ who already have paid the 
price for me. And when I break down in the presence of God, he can tell me, go up, bald head, go up, bald head. Go up, angry man, go up, angry man. And I will say, that is under the blood because I fell on my face that moment and cried out to God and said, forgive me of this sin, God, that has offended you. And when he forgives me, he remembers or not. He only sees the righteousness of Christ. <sighs> He uses guilt as a hammer. I'm talking about Satan to bring you down and break, get you back from going after God and not letting you go. See the challenge? The first challenge was the challenge of spiritual authority, of the impossible doors being opened. The second challenge was the fruit challenge. You needed to show that you were going to be fruitful in the hard places where nobody can be fruitful. And the third challenge is for you to get past the mocking spirit of Satan and of everybody who does not believe that that you can live a close life with the Lord. When I was a young boy, I remember a pastor here, not in this town, in another town, but in the same area, who looked at me when I was really, really young. I must have been 17 or 18. And he told me, there is no way you can be a missionary. No, mm -mm, no, no. He told me this because I wanted to be a missionary I never could and you sure cannot he was telling me he was a lot better than I could be and I remember I was standing there thinking I'm in trouble wow I asked him why do you think that he said well you know who's going to listen to you you're too young you know where are you going to get the money to go to these places how is that going to be I mean where's the language knowledge that you need to have to go over here what is the the, the, the organization that is going to back you up and all that he gave me that list of 10 things Go up, oh head, go up. I'm going to find the very thing that you don't have so that I can rub it in your face and say you're not good at it. Oh, you can't speak publicly? Talk to Moses. I'm not good in the facility of my words. I can't do that. And on and on and on and on, the things that you cannot do and all this stuff, the mocker will stand in your face and bring you down every single time. And you need to stop listening to him. Stop listening to him. Now, I'm not saying about the voice of reason that come from somebody. You know, I've had people who come tell me, you know, I'm the next, you know, great singer. And they sound like a frog. I mean... That's delusional. I'm, I'm not going to be, you know, going with you. Well, yeah, yeah, mijo, you know, you're going to be the great. No, no. I mean, you need a miracle. Let's pray for a miracle. God, give you a miracle. Take the frog voice away. <laughs> I, I'm not talking about that. If you're five foot three, chances are, unless you can jump really high, you're not going to be the next Michael Jordan. Now, there are some five foot three people who played in the NBA, by the way. I mean, I'm not, I'm people who can dunk, by the way. But you need to be the one in one billion in order for you to be that one person. That's okay. I mean, I, I know the limits. I'm not saying that the dumb thing that everybody says, you're know, you going to do whatever you believe, and that's not true. But I got to tell you what is true. Your limit is not whatever Satan says. Your limit is not whatever the world says. Your limit is not whatever his mockers say. Oh, you want me to prove it to you? The people who laughed at me the most when I was trying to seek God with all my face, I was in Bible college and my classmates were the ones who laughed the most. I used to get up at 4 a.m. to pray, right? I'd be kneeling down. My roommate will get up. To go to the restroom and he'll come back and he look at me. This at his literal face, he was like, Are you praying? I'll be like, Yeah. At 4 a.m. Not even God is awake right now. It got so bad he started getting all the people. They did not get up early, but they will get up early to laugh at me. One time they did a whole deal where they brought all these candles and they pretended like it was a funeral. About five of them showed up with the candles in their face like this. We gathered here together. I was about 5 a.m., you know, with our beloved brother who seemed to be I'm going crazy. He thinks he needs to pray at 5 a.m. <sighs> they were mocking. I know they were kids. I, I didn't take it against them, but I knew what Satan was doing. Satan 
was laughing in my face, saying, you don't have to go up that way. You don't have to commit to God that way. You don't have to be so crazy that way. Come back to the pack. Run with the pack. You don't have to run this way by yourself. They just did not know that my personality goes against those things. The more they laugh, the more I pray. Even when I didn't want to pray, I got up just to go against them. But I know what it does. It grabs you. It makes you, it makes you go down. People will look you in the face and laugh. I've had intellectuals look at me, look me in the eye and said, how can you have gone to so much school and not know the most essential thing that religion is just a psychological aid for people who are weak-minded? Intellectuals have told me this. Go up, smart man, go up. All this schooling and you're still stupid. <laughs> This is, there is no wonder that this is the one group that he turned to. He called out the chi bears and they killed 42 of these ones. Not because God was, you know, he was overreacting because somebody called him bald That's a little bit too much of an overreaction, by the way. But he knew the importance of facing down this challenge that you may bring down the naysayer from hell and bring in the one who said that his promises are yes and amen. He's calling us without repentance. He is taking you up to the high calling. And on the process, you're going to face these three challenges. I am asking you to look into your own life and understand. If God is challenging you, you'll know that these are challenges you're going to have to face. If you want to have the high calling in your life. The authority challenge. The doors that only God can open. The fruit challenge, you will have to be known by your fruit. And the demonic laughter and mocking of things trying to stop you from getting there. In fact, after he had brought down those boys, he went up, the Bible says, to Mount Carmel. Why? Because he had defeated the enemy. He had faced down the struggle. God has allowed him to rise up into his high calling. This prophet will become powerful in the presence of God. If you read his life, you will find every single one of the things that I said. Throughout the pages, you'll find him fulfilling his fruits and his authority. When your men walk up to him, another, I, I, you know, a captain in the army and told him because he had prophesied there'll be food here tomorrow and it's going to be cheap. They were in a siege where people were actually eating each other. Literally, there, were, there was cannibal, cannibalism going on in there because of the siege they were facing. People were eating their own children. They had lost their mind. And the prophet has stood there and he says, tomorrow there will be cheap food in this place. And that man said to him, it ain't going to happen. Even if there's a window open in the heavens, it's not going to happen. And if you remember the passage, the prophet looked to him and he said it will happen you're just not going to taste of it and if you read the next chapter you'll find out that God brought to pass whatever he said because when there was no door God made a door because God backed up the men in authority not in private but in public another time you know, there was a whole army that came against him, and they surrounded him, and there was no door. The man that was beside him was freaking out. He was saying, we're dead, we're dead, we're dead. <laughs> you know, we have a whole army against us. It's just you and I, and you're just a prophet, you know, with an old mantle. What are you going to do? And the, old, the, pro, the prophet said, <laughs> open up his eyes, Lord. He's not seeing the things the way that he sees. And all of a sudden, he opened up his eyes, and there was a host of angels round about them. And he said, it is bigger and greater, the group that is with us, that is with them. And he does not does that mean number? Okay, there's 50 with us, there's 20 with them. It means the power of God was upon them in such a way that the demon in hell was going to touch them. And those little puny soldiers were nothing in the presence of God. He will open a door where there is no door. He will produce fruit where there is no fruit. A king said, I'm going to kill him. And went after him. This is the closest that the prophet came to cursing. He said, who is the son of a prostitute? 
He said it in a kind way, though, not in a bad way. The prophet said, look, look at this murderer, the son of a murderer, he said. Bring, let, 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 him, let him come over here. And he said, but I am going to prophesy, and I'm going to tell him what's going to happen. Because they faced him down, and the mockers told him it's not going to happen, and he made it happen. Another young man told him, you know, there's not enough food here, you know, to, for us to, to be able to feed 100 people. And he said, there is, because God is going to provide. And he rested, lifted up his hand and prayed over it. And the Bible says that they produced for the 100 and for everybody else. And they had leftovers because God produced where there could be no production. Even after he was dead, the bones were buried in chapter 13 of 2 Kings. You remember this? There were already the bones there of the old prophet. Elijah had died already. And a year after he had died, somebody rolled a body right in there and the body resurrected. The prophet said, there is authority and there is fruit. And we bring down the mocking spirit of Satan. We will face it head on. Right now, brothers and sisters, that's the spirit in which we have to move. We have to move full of fruits. We have to move full of authority in the Lord. If we die, we die. But let it be fighting the fight of the Lord. And we have to move with purpose to a Mount Carmel, to our, our high calling. We have to understand that there will be roadblocks coming along. Roadblocks coming along. Roadblocks coming along. This is why the old prophet Elijah had told Elisha, stay here or stay here or stay here. He was telling him, you're going to find roadblocks where you're going to want to stop and say, I'm not going past this thing. And he wanted to test his spirit to see if he was going to break through all these things and get to the price of a high calling. If you're here right now, I got to tell you that you have the high calling in front of you still. And that God desires to use you in a mighty way. Yet these things have to be broken. You have to be so committed right now that God will back up your word, back up your deed, back up what you put your hands to. You'll be, you have to be such in prayer and in seeking of his face that he will produce fruit in your life. You have to be so enthralled and committed to God that you will not let the mocking spirit stop you at the door of the great calling of your life. God is doing his thing still. And I'm asking you to go ahead to Omar and Carmel. I know the old prophet Elijah must have smiled from the heaven. Looking at the young men struggling through these things, saying, I remember when I faced those things down. Go ahead, boy. God is going to use you. He used them mightily, even after he was dead. He became a prophet of such a caliber that when a whole army, three armies were starving, actually were, were dying of thirst, they looked for somebody. Where do we find somebody who can actually produce water? where there is no water in this desert. Said, oh, oh, there was a young man here. There's one named Elisha who used to pour water upon Elijah. He can. What a reputation. They came knocking on his door. He looked at the ping and he says, do I know you? He said, go look for the prophets of your mother and the prophets of your father. That's a man of God right there. You face down a king and you look him in the eye. And he said, no, you're a heathen. Go chase down the ones. What are you looking at me for? And then Jehoshaphat was there. Jehoshaphat, what are you doing with this company? Well, I'll do it because of him right there. They said, you know, that's a man of God. I'll do it. Now, it isn't that I can't do it. In fact, they said, you know, bring something. And they started playing. And he started dancing and doing his thing. And prophesied. And brought water in that desert land. He said, there will be no rain. You're not going to hear thunder. Yet there will be water and there will be water. And that place is going to be full of water. And it happened as he said it. Because God will back up his own. This is the kind of season we're living in. 
We got to face down the kings and the princes. We got to be able to talk to the ones who are in charge and the ones who are following. We got to talk to the masses and we got to talk to the ones who are leading. And in all of it, God has to be backing us up. And I'm asking you to bow down to the Lord and move into his presence that he may use you in this hour like never before. May God honor you and bless you. Amen.